John. Um, I was asked to discuss Evergreens for Kentucky landscapes and I added conifers because I have one plant that I particularly like and it doesn't fit evergreen. So there you go. Uh, anyway, we do have uh, nursery crops and they said they were all going to add that and send that to you. Within our uh, web page under UKREC nursery crops, there is a site for the Theater Klein Plant Awards and it describes all the years that the awards have been given for different plants and within those years from the 1990s into 2021, uh, many of the, uh, not many, but at least one every year or so is an evergreen plant, uh, viburnums, different types of uh, trees and shrubs that are in the evergreen class. So you can go through there and there is on the site an actual paper list, a document that lists all of the uh, award winners that you can scroll through besides linking on each year and finding out what we awarded for each year. And it shows something like this. For example, uh, Cephalotaxis is an evergreen um, that people like to grow mainly because deer tend to leave it alone. But of course, <laughs> deer will eat anything, but um, in most cases, they tend to leave this particular plant alone. And so I'll do a little discussion on Cephalotaxis uh, harringtonia. So some of, this is what the picture actually looks like when you uh, see it just as the picture alone. And this is a small form that came from Duke Gardens. Um, and it, the Duke Gardens are a small garden in North Carolina that uh, is excellent, excellent. If you ever get a chance, good structure, really uh, kind of in a hilly, ravine country, and, and it has a great collection of plant materials. This particular plant is an upright. So we just looked at what I would call a shrub, and this is an upright vestigiata. I took this picture at Cheekwood. If you go and you get up on the uh, balcony there off the museum, and take a, a look down at the pool, and then you go to the right and you'll see this plant. So it's an upright. Uh, the reason I mentioned it is because there's several of the uprights that are really slow growing. This is a uh, prostate form, uh, very grows very low and can be used as a ground cover. So as you can see, this is typical of almost all evergreens and conifers is that because of bud sports, sprouts, witches brooms, there's all different sizes and shapes within the genus. So it's pretty cool. We can pick whatever we want. Uh, another resource that I use fairly frequently now is the tree book and there are evergreens in this book. Uh, but this is my favorite for landscaping with evergreens. And of course, they use the term conifers because there's a number of conifers that are deciduous. Uh, most people think of bald cypress and dawn redwood. By the way, <laughs> dawn redwood is not in this presentation, but it's one of my favorite plants. And I'm getting weary of the uh, Japanese beetles bronzing it to death. When you have a 40 foot tall tree, it's really ugly one when you got Japanese beetles and I have no way of spraying it. And they include ginkgo as a, as a conifer. So John Ruder is a professor at the University of Georgia and Tom Cox is one of the leading collectors of evergreens in the world. And he is also housed in Georgia and has a fabulous garden that the Conifer Society frequently visits. Speaking of the Conifer Society, you can often get excellent descriptions of many of the evergreens. Just type in, what, what, what are you looking for? Colorado blue spruce, Norway spruce, uh, uh, different types of firs, and they have outstanding descriptions of the recommended hardiness zone, you name it. It's, it's excellent online resource. I wanted to mention a few places in the state of Kentucky where you can go and look at extensive collections of conifers, evergreens. And the Baker Arboretum is one. 
And these two gentlemen, Jerry Baker, who owned the property that uh, Mitchell Leichhardt, landscape architect, designer, was landscaping over many years for him. And the two of them have developed an extensive collection that I shouldn't say the two of them, they both have passed away and I sincerely miss them. Uh, they were just great conversationalists, great people to visit with. And I, uh, that's a Baker Arboretum in Bowling Green. Uh, they, the first time I ever went there was the grand opening of the museum, which only had one display and it was some barn doors done by their buddy, World War II buddy, Joe Downing, who never came home to the United States. He stayed in uh, France and is the only American to have a, not the only probably by now, but for many, many years, he was the only American to have a gallery setting studio at uh, the Louvre. Very cool. And if you go there, they have a museum of Joe Downing's artwork. And every window in the museum as you walk around the outside will show you a different evergreen, as you can see here, and here, and here, and back there in the corner, there's a ex extensive evergreen collection. I mean, just great place. Bernheim Forest has quite a few evergreens as well. Uh, they had a deer fence that was uh, up and it's still up, but somehow they've allowed deer to move into the collection and literally uh, damaged most of the arborvitaes, but uh, they have a pretty good collection there. When we're talking about evergreens, hollies, ilex, are a major portion of that. And for many years, the key area on hollies was this area. Uh, Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, and West Kentucky, Louisville area. And it was mostly through the driving force of Buddy Hubbock, who was the chief horticulturist at Bernheim, Theodore Klein, Udell Gardens, Bob Simpson, who was mostly known for developing uh, <laughs> leaf spot resistant uh, crab apples. John Bon Hartline, an outstanding, outstanding nurseryman. John Ford, secret. They mentioned the different places they collected plants from. But all those individuals I knew uh, personally, and that was an excellent part of my life, is getting to know those individuals. Udell Gardens also has a collection of different types of evergreens. They have a weeping pine that just knocks me out every time I see it. but. I don't think they're sure exactly what it is. So get there. Uh, in addition to Udell, meaning use or taxes, which was his primary uh, product from his nursery, is different, different use, different taxes. He also, as he has in his castle, a uh, indication of an, an interest in the hollies. And those of you who've been to Udell know that he was an outstanding building and construction and actually he and his landscape crew built this home well built just about everything that's there and it's all surrounded by different types of evergreens but you use were the primary thing that he grew and regrettably uh, some form of disease that was never truly identified came into the collection and basically eliminated a great number of the taxes or use from the collection. So I'm not gonna mention taxes or use or even boxwoods too much in this presentation. This is a sweetness, um, the taxes, uh, I'm sorry, Tasuga, uh, Sergeant Dye, which is uh, Sergeant's weeping hemlock. This plant was found as a sport uh, from seedlings in a nursery that came up from seed. And there were four of them that had this shape. And three of them are still alive in different gardens around the United States. And uh, so having a significant example at Udell uh, really is nice. And there's a number now of plants in this category 
that grow a little faster for those of us in the nursery landscape business who would like to add this type of a design feature to a landscape. So you can look and find a listing of different types of weeping hemlocks uh, in your uh, online. And then in addition to the ones I just mentioned, throughout anywhere around us, we're surrounded by outstanding uh, sites that have native and uh, introduced evergreens available for viewing. So uh, it's just out, this is just a wonderful area to uh, study plants. But uh, Buddy Hubbock put in a collection of Virginia pine to create a, what he called the sun and shade garden at Bernheim. And they don't stand well as individual specimens and tend to get to a height where they're easy to be easily blown over. And almost all of those plants are gone. And thankfully, a lot of the plants that he did plant after putting in these uh, Virginia pines have taken over and have started to create sh more shade in the sunshade garden. But this particular plant uh, wouldn't necessarily be recommended as a individual specimen. It would be more uh, planted as a grove to use as he did to create a canopy. Uh, the firs, um, there's only a few that do very well in Kentucky. Avis concour does pretty well, a white fir. It has a great diversity of different types of needles. The one on the right, the upright conical plant is uh, just straight Avis concour. Con yes, uh, white fir. And on the uh, right side is a, uh, a blue form. So within Avis Concord, there's lots of different uh, color schemes that can be fit into and used in our landscapes. Avis normanii, uh, normaniana is a plant that was, is selected as a theater climb plant award. Our plant here at the station was from Theater Klein in 1980. It was planted during a drought year and it's done exceptionally well. And so it's, an, it's a very good plant. And when Theater Klein was doing landscape work and had landscape crews, this was his go-to fur for Kentucky, Avis Nordmaniana, okay. And this is ours here at the station that we got from him. And it's actually probably about another third bigger than it shows in this picture. But it has a seasonal interest. So here at the station, it's planted more or less away from the building and out of sight. But if you had one in your yard, um, you could get to enjoy the cones and, and the different types of, of structures and the new foliage. When I went to uh, Europe with a group of students, horticulture students in our hort club, back some time ago, uh, I saw the Cedrus Labani in the uh, Loire Valley of France, almost everywhere. And I said, oh my gosh, this thing is spectacular. And so I came home and found out it doesn't grow here, it's not hardy, but there is a Cedrus Labani subspecies, Stenocoma, that it's believed was collected from the mountains of Lebanon and has been very hardy and has done very well in our landscape. And that's it. And you might see there's a bird roosting on the top of the tree. And occasionally those birds will break out the bud and you end up with kind of a flat top. With Stenocoma, I haven't seen that so much, but with Cedrus labani, the straight species genus, you, you do see it, especially in some of the Europe where the older gardens are. And this is what it looks like up close. It's a very, very, very attractive plant as a cedar. And we've been very pleased with its performance here, uh, planted in, uh, in a clay, uh, limestone-based soil here. Boxwood, well, you know, we used to use it extensively. <laughs> I mean, crazy. 
and I guess we still do. So there's lots of great boxwood plants out there. The leading nursery in boxwood studies is the Sanders Nursery in Virginia. Paul Sanders has been a boxwood aficionado for a lifetime. He's now in his late 80s. And the plants that we have here, we do have a collection of 32 cultivars here at the station. If anybody would like to come and see the different shapes and sizes, we do not trim them. So they're grown as their native habitat or native uh, habit. Uh, and they uh, do, do very well, except for one, which is one of the newer ones. And they've, they've come out with some that are resistant to boxwood blight. They're called new generation boxwoods, independence and freedom. And one of them, I can't recall right now, uh, has some leaf diseases and doesn't seem to look as good as the other. That could have been the fact that we only have two plants of each instead of a significant collection of maybe three to five and can eliminate some of the problem with the original source of the plants. But anyway, you can still find quite a few boxwoods being heavily used. Um, Kevin Collard in Leachfield is probably Kentucky's leading expert on boxwood and grows and uses them in the landscapes that he works on designs. I put this one in because uh, my children like this plant for some reason and have it in their landscapes. It doesn't always perform that well. And um, so, whoops. Uh, I, I, Cupressus arizonica is a little bit shaky for our area, but it has this dramatic blue foliage and it's really nice and we like it. And, uh, so we're trying, they're trying to grow it. So I'll just put that out there because you can go to different garden centers, especially some of the, um, I'll spit it out some year, some of the local uh, like Lowe's, Home Depot's and those kind of places. And they'll have this plant. Uh, I, I've mentioned these plants in talks before. So some of you may have uh, heard my discussion. This is, Juniperus virginiana, which is our native red cedar, and it's a cultivar called Taylor. And I have two children that live in Phoenix, and they can grow Italian cypress all day long, as long as you give it a little water. But uh, we can't in St. Louis or here in Kentucky. But we do have our native virginiana, our eastern red cedar cultivars that are very tight that people have managed to select off the side of the road or somewhere, you can do it. And um, they do quite well in mimicking um, Italian cypress. So if that's a look you want or fits your house or you've been to Italy and Tuscan and you, you want that look, you can get it from uh, several of our cultivars of our native Eastern red cedar and they will stay green year round. The only difficulty we have is the root system on these plants is fairly coarse. It doesn't like too much water. And you'll see over in the side there on the right side that those plants are staked. And this is one that I grow called Greenpoint. And it, I mentioned that coarse root system makes it a little difficult to transplant B&B. &B. So if you're going to get into some of these types of upright tight plants, you might want to buy them as container plants. Uh, this is my favorite plant on the face of the earth since I was a young person working in a nursery in my hometown of East Quag, New York. Uh, Calmia latifolia, the mountain laurels are spectacularly beautiful and someone kept telling me that it was in land between the lakes and I didn't believe them, but it is and it is extensively and it does very well. So this is part of its, its attraction is that it has tight buds and the buds themselves are dense enough on the plant to, to be very showy and very attractive. And, and this is what the plant looks like up close. 
and I'm checking my time. So let's uh, do a little uh, Linnaeus test. The ericaceous plants have stamens in clusters of five times two. So there's 10 stamens on one side of the flower. If you look and count there, let's see, maybe, yeah, yeah. There's these stem five on this side. Uh, one of them is actually pointed directly at us, so you can't really see it. And five on this side, so that's 10 with a long tubular style. And as you know, the botanical is based on the flower. So most ericaceous plants, rhododendrons, azaleas, calmias, sourwood, you know, there's a lot of ericaceous plants all have that same cluster of five on one side, five on the other side, and a long tubular single uh, style. Very cool. And this is what you get in the fall. You can collect these seeds out of these seed pods and take them home and grow, but they're a little fussy. It requires a lot of moisture. Most people use a tray with peat moss and then they build a tent over the tray and they use uh, like some of the things that food products come in, but it's a beautiful plant. I we mentioned earlier Ilex. This is one that was selected by Bon Hartline in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, regrettably, he named it Chief Paducah, which is a male name, and it uh, has fruit, so it's a female plant. Uh, they have separate. When I first came to Western Kentucky back in, in, in 80 or 79, actually, there were a lot of Ilex opaca around. And one of the reasons was they used them to make grave blankets and they would cut all that foliage off and weave it into a chicken wire mesh and lay it over a grave uh, as a winter protection and decoration. Then what happened? Of course, the seeds fell off into the grave sites and the cemeteries and, the, and they grew up and we ended up with plants and so many selections in Western Kentucky and Southern Illinois and Indiana were actually made in cemeteries. And this one was the cemetery in Oak Grove. Uh, this is Theodore Klein's actual selection that he made and he named about, I guess, 15 or 20 different hollies. But this is named after his niece, Judy Evans. And you'll see the plant appears to be a little chopped up that's because we named it as a theater client plant award. People went to Bernheim and took cuttings. And so they, they hacked up the plant quite a bit. Um, this is a Taxus Media, just a reminder that you Dell and Taxus is the common name is you. Uh, there's lots of different choices of different sizes. And this is called stovepipe and is surprisingly upright. Okay, just to give you some background on the different types of plants that we can use in upright evergreens. This end one here is North Pole. North Pole was uh, proven winners. It was developed by my major professor, uh, Dr. Art Bow, And uh, it has a very upright habitat, uh, habit, and it is remarkably green in winter. But even it's showing a little browning this particular winter, almost everything. Morgan is a very short stubby and it's used extensively to line driveways and walkways and to define areas. And it has a very nice light green, almost yellowish cast in the summer. DeGroote Spire, I've never seen him this burn or browned up. Uh, just a tough year, 2019, 2020. But Greenpoint, our Eastern Red Cedar, upright form. This is a very small plant. Uh, it's only about eight, six, eight feet high. Um, it held up well. So when we start talking about alternatives to arbovites, and, and those of you who know, arbovite are like candy to deer. They, they just love them. And many nurseries that grow extensive amounts of arbovite find that they have to fence the area where they grow the arborvitae. So this is this summer after they have all uh, had an opportunity to regreen and look nice. And there's that little uh, 
yellowness on the small Morgan. And there's a new one on the very end called Star Power. And we're really excited about it. It is again, a Eastern Red Cedar cultivar from uh, Mike Yanni at Johnson's Nursery in Wisconsin. Have a high expectations. And there's North Pole. I, I, I can't get enough of it because Art Bo was the man who helped me get my PhD at the University of Idaho, went on to be department chairman at North Dakota. Okay, magnolias are, have a group in, within magnolias that are evergreen and the most infamous, infamous or <laughs> internationally recognized is Magnolia grandiflora. It was a stellar plant that John Bartram spread all over the world and people went gaga over it and spent fortunes on it back when, and when he was distributing seeds to different places in the world. So Magnolia grandiflora, Southern Magnolia, when you see it like this, you, what, you have to have one. Well, when my mother moved from New York to North Carolina, she had to have one. And I learned a valuable lesson. They're a trashy tree. They're always dropping something. Uh, the leaves fall off and they don't break down very quickly. The, um, the seed pods fall off. They're very hard once dried and uh, limbs and all kinds of things fall off. So if you want to have this plant, and many do, I mean, I would like to have it, but I don't because I have too much shade. But uh, if you'd like to have this plant, please give, put it in a location where you can walk to it and look at it and be excited by it and then um, say, okay, uh, I love it. And I'm gonna just mow around it and leave, it, leave all that trash there. Uh, but there are other forms and Magnolia grandiflora gets to be a huge tree. Most towns in Western Kentucky have uh, uh, quite a number of different types of plants that have survived cold winters and you'll find them everywhere. Here in Princeton, Kentucky, they're on, in parks, people's yards, but you can see why, it's beautiful. And the most commonly bought and many people may not know they're actually buying it, is Bracken's Brown Beauty because it's performed really, really well as a plant for landscapes. And it does have this brown fuzz on the bottoms of the leaves. All Magnolia grandiflora have this to some extent, but Bracken's Brown Beauty has it quite, quite extensively. And Bracken's Brown Beauty can be grown all the way from the Gulf Coast to up into Cincinnati and even Mount Vernon, Illinois. So it's, it's known to be a very good hardy cultivar. Whoops, I meant to mention Little Gem. Uh, because of the size of Magnolia grandiflora, a lot of people just can't accommodate it. But Little Gem is a dwarfer form, doesn't get as tall, um, can it still probably gets 20, 25, 30 feet, but it's very slow growing and it can be maintained at a lower height and a smaller form for a longer period of time. The only thing I worry about with Little Gem is we really haven't defined the level of hardiness. And I have seen some of the Little Gem plants not look that good. And I'm not sure if that's the soil or if it's the plant itself. Uh, Pisces orientalis, when we talk about spruces, um, we better, there's quite a number of diseases that Norway spruce and Colorado blue spruce get. And Colorado blue spruce has almost been eliminated from East uh, Michigan, Kentucky, Ohio, a lot of these states. We have four diseases, needle cast and others, all caused by fungi that have definitely affected the ability to grow Colorado blue spruce. And we'll have a magnificent plant in someone's yard. It'll be 15 to 20 feet tall, beautiful green, 
and all of a sudden it'll get needle cast and it just goes away. I mean, in a very short period of time. So Pisces orientalis, and this one is a yellow uh, uh, variegated form, has done fairly well in difficult sites. This is at Baker Arboretum. This is in a, a little fountain area. It's just kind of a small amount of soil in a raised bed up on a patio. And it's done very well for many years and it's very attractive and attracts attention. People wanna know what it is and where they can get it. We've switched also some to Cryptomeria. Uh, Yoshino has done very well in Nashville and in Cincinnati, in Louisville, Lexington areas in Kentucky. And it has, as it ages, it has a very nice bark, uh, very attractive. And people are pretty pleased with it in general at this moment in time. But we have grown Colorado blue spruce for lifetimes in Eastern United States uh, without too many problems. As a matter of fact, we have a massive grove here at the experiment station that uh, is still doing well and hasn't exhibited any of the problems that those four fungal diseases I mentioned. I did wanna, that's why I put conifers in the title. This is actually a deciduous plant, Pseudolarx camperi, uh, golden larch, just, just a wonderful, wonderful plant. I, I just love it. <laughs> I couldn't help. Okay, sorry. Moving on. And, oh, and then this is its structure. When it gets older, you'll find this like at Spring Grove Cemetery, these types of plants. Some of the big, bigger, older gardens around the country will have it as a large deciduous plant. It's very attractive. This is Pisces abies. Now, remember, I said Norway spruce uh, is susceptible to these same four fungal diseases as Colorado blue spruce. And yet this one here at the experiment station, I don't know when it was planted. Uh, Army Armstrong, probably in the 30s or 40s, maybe even in the 50s, planted it. And it's done remarkably well in spite of a gravel road near it and uh, traffic driving across the grass, tractors and different types of uh, chemicals being used in the pastures nearby, it's done remarkably well. So we can just knock on wood on that one. But we do have to keep in mind, Colorado Blue and Norway uh, are having problems in our landscapes. And this is Norway, Pendula. This is what I call the three gentlemen they weren't supposed to be removed during the construction at our site, but uh, the contractor got a little uh, ahead of the curve and hadn't read the landscape part and they were accidentally taken out. But I planted these in 1980 and they were removed in excellent condition in uh, 2018. So I, I'm wondering if maybe the Norways might be a little less susceptible to the diseases that attack Colorado blue spruce, but I'll have to check with some of my colleagues and friends and plants people and see what they have to say about that. Just a magnificent plant. I love it. Okay, rhododendrons, they're native to uh, Kentucky, mostly in the eastern part. This is Maxima the giant uh, rhododendron that is uh, native in uh, the Appalachia area. And there's another one, rhododendron caroliniana. They all do remarkably well in those areas. And sometimes they're such thick areas that you cannot move through the plant material, uh, just literally like cane breaks, just solid plants. And when you get to see them in bloom, they have a very simple flat bloom, but very attractive. Very, very attractive. This one I mentioned because there are breeders everywhere. When I moved to Western Kentucky, there was a breeder named Dr. Henry Schroeder in Evansville. And he made a significant impact on people's interest in azaleas and rhododendrons by breeding them and having a nursery that he ran on the side. Regrettably, he was killed in a car accident and he had already named this plant after his wife, uh, Mrs. 
Henry Schroeder. And it's a very attractive plant. I took the picture, as you can see by the label, in the Missouri Botanic Garden, where they had an extensive collection of rhododendrons and azaleas. Uh, I, I love the rhododendrons. The Korean forms of azaleas always seem to do fairly well for us in West Kentucky, but they also get root diseases, just like blueberries. Um, and so Phytophthora, and we have to be careful of our siding. Typically, and I'll mention this related to the Calmia, when I went into Land Between the Lakes and found those mountain laurel, they are growing in ravines, well-drained and moist, with sandy, gravelly soils, sandstone-based, and about a foot of organic matter on top made up of leaf mulch and other things from the canopy. And this appears to be an ideal situation for any of the shallow rooted uh, rhododendrons and azaleas, mountain laurel. They tend to grow root systems in the very top of the soil. So they need adequate moisture. They don't need flooding. They don't need saturated soils by any means but they do need a high level of organic matter over a very well-drained soil. So if you have that, definitely go for it. Uh, I mentioned PJM, uh, that's PJ Merritt. This uh, Merrill, this, this plant has been around for a long, long time because it is more tolerant of alkaline conditions. So it can tolerate higher pHs and you'll see it, uh, this, purplish flower as a rhododendron that's used fairly extensively. This is a new one. Well, I say new, it's not new to most plant people. In Karho was found in a German nursery uh, and it didn't have to be treated for acid soils. It would grow in fairly high pH soil, 6.5, which is typical of, of Kentucky. So they're pretty excited about it. Well, they started breeding it and so that they could keep the tolerance of soils of higher pH and come up with better flowers. The original plant was a very pale pink, but now they have darker pinks, almost to red and purple, and it, it's getting to be a quite extensively promoted plant by Plant Nueva. And Decker's Nursery, a wholesale nursery in Ohio, uh, grows quite a bit of this and they graft a lot of the older cultivars onto in Carho rootstock. So we've had great success with several of the old ironclad rhododendrons here at the station planted in our limestone based clay soils. And so it has great potential. Okay, I'm supposed to be done, and guess what? I think this is the last plant. There's a lot of viburnums that are evergreen. Not all of the evergreen ones have fragrance. Um, Eskimo doesn't, but Mohawk does. So I put it in Eskimo because the blooms are so dense. You, all you have is a big white ball when you have this plant in your landscape and it is evergreen and it can provide a outstanding uh, form of viburnum in your yard. But I would go for the Mohawk or some of the other cultivars that are evergreen that have fragrance, if I can find them. And um, just like every yard should have a dogwood and a red bud, every yard should have a fragrant viburnum. Uh, because we can grow them fairly well without too much problem. And the, the fragrance will match any kind of lilac or any other kind of fragrant plant you might think of. Okay. So that's kind of it. When you look at evergreens, there are so many. I, I thought initially when I was asked, oh, evergreens, do I have many pictures of evergreens? Well, I have tens of thousands of pictures of evergreens. When you pull in all the different types of shade uh, adaptable plants, you pull in all of the shrubs, ground covers, 
we used to use junipers extensively as ground covers, and uh, we've gone away from that. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe the cost. Uh, also, weeds and junipers is kind of a problem. But uh, yeah, so there's lots of different evergreens that we can use in our landscapes if you want to have that green. You can actually pick different variegated forms and end up with a palette of different greens and yellows, lime colors, that can make a landscape. And there used to be a lot of people that did that very thing, mixed up the color of the foliage to make uh, landscape designs. So if you want to get into it, there you go. You can give it a shot. 